All right. Well, it's good to be here. And, uh, you know, we, we've talked about doing this for a while because uh, the whole idea of having a, a message from, from God is that the Holy Spirit would illuminate the scripture and we would be able to see what God is saying, right? Yes. And so, uh, you know, that's our hope. That's our goal. And, um, and so today's message was a focus on, it came out of, it came out of a just prayer time or time before God, whatever that is, prayer or whatever, and asking God the question, what would it look like? God, God, as you look at what's happened over the last five years, the last years of President Obama's administration, first three years of President Trump's administration, God, and then, you know, coming up and you're seeing all this different stuff happening and now there's this whole Black Lives Matter piece of social unrest that we've seen bubbling. We all just we all just want the solution, correct? Right? What, what's the formula? You know how do how do we get this thing done? And and that's kind of the question that we we ask. And 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 really at the end of the day, it comes down to what's the real problem? Because if all we're doing is treating symptoms, correct? correct. Then then, then we're wasting time because the cancer that is beneath, whatever that is that has infected us as a nation, it makes sense that if, it, if it's happening nationally, that it would come down into our states, Correct. our counties, and our cities. Because when you, when you have a disease mm -hmm. and you just treat the symptoms, the disease progresses. Mm -hmm. Treating the symptoms does not cure the disease. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. So it's still advancing in your body. And you, so, yeah. So if we fix one thing, it's going to manifest another way. Correct. Correct. Hmm. It's still there progressing, hmm. uh, uh, wreaking havoc in your body. It's still there. You may not feel it or you may be numb to it because the medication numbs you to the pain or the irritation of the symptoms of the disease, but it's still there. You know, it, it was interesting. Um, you know, we, we worked across the county in feeding some 280,000 people. But when feeding those 280,000 people, uh, one of the things that we saw was that we come in contact with not only black folks, but white folks, not only urban, rural and suburban folks and that kind of deal. Yeah. And so one of the sisters, a white sister I came in contact with, she said, and this was after the so-called riot in Birmingham, right? The, the two block riot or whatever it was, right? But it was a riot and I couldn't figure out, I didn't grow up here, right? Yeah. So why it bothered her so much? She said, well, as a little girl, I went to those, uh, my brother took me to one of those gatherings. Oh, yeah. So she was talking about a clan gathering, right? So I had to really listen. She said, and I really didn't know what it meant. And my parents didn't know, but if they knew, I'm not sure it would have bothered them. And so I'm listening like, well, I mean, what are we talking about, right? And then, and then she says this, she says, but I never thought that I would see that again. What she saw in the 60s happened in Birmingham. She never thought that she would see it again. And so I think it's, it's like what you said when you have a, let's say you have cancer or some serious disease. Once you get past this phase, your hope and prayer is that cured. you're cured and you, and you never see it again. Exactly. And I think that a lot of folks were really shocked because they saw it again. And it was always there. And the thing about what we're going through now, mm -hmm. it wasn't even in remission. It was still actively deteriorating our society. Mm. We just didn't notice it or didn't see it because we were sedated mm -hmm. with a with a few tokens here or there. Uh, uh. You know, and, and it distracted us from the pain of the disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's kind of like what Brother Malcolm said. He says, he says, when you go to the dentist, he gives you Novocaine. Correct. So that you can suffer, suffer peacefully. peacefully. And I think one of the things you're saying is that we've been suffering peacefully, but we haven't been, but we've still been 
suffering. suffering. Yes, yes. And, and perhaps some people harder than other people. Correct. Right. And so that was kind of the message, you know, that was kind of the inquiry of God. So part of, part of, you know, when I think about pastoring and I think about, when I think about a prophetic message for this time, mm -hmm. then part of it is being an intercessor, right? Right. That I'm going to God on behalf of the people and of the nation, the people, our family, our covenant community right. fellowship, our, our community. And then I'm coming back to the community. I'm, and so I'm going back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so each week in hope of a prophetic message that will meet us where we are, it comes from having been with God and then I'm coming back and we're walking through it together. You know, one of the things that interests me and I wanted to ask you, your approach to this message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, what? how did you frame it? What were you thinking about? What did you see? What was God saying during that time as you were listening and going to God on behalf of the people? I think sometimes that we confuse um, great or relevant preaching having to do with the homily, having to do with how to put forth, a, put together a message. I have a, have a couple of Old Testament scriptures, a couple of New Testament right. scriptures, mm -hmm. and then having a great story to tell, and then uh, a poem to end with, and voila, you got it, and right? three points, right? Three points, three points and a poem, one. right? <laughs> yes, so right. being a preacher's girl, you know about I that, know right? I know about that, yes. Right? And so, but I think in, in, as far as in the Bible, some of the best teaching was more so prophetic. In other words, they were seeking God for his word to what was relevant for that day. And that God was giving them a word in season, a word that was in response to whatever was ailing men. Now, I like how you describe that because the prophetic word is not this mysterious magical thing right 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 okay. right right so I, I like the fact that you just described what mm -hmm. a prophetic word is and we still need messages like that today mm -hmm. correct correct we still do mm -hmm. because we need to know what god is saying about yes. this right yes. otherwise what we got is a bunch of pastors or preachers or teachers or uh different folks across the, the spectrum pontificating about mm -hmm. what their opinion is and the like. Mm -hmm. And so if we ask the question, when famine came and it was mentioned in the Bible, well, how did God interact with his people? When pestilence came, mm -hmm. how was God interacting with his people? Mm -hmm. um, when, 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 all the, when earthquakes and all these different natural disasters came, how did God interact with his people? And if God is today, yesterday, today, and forevermore, yeah. Yeah then he's probably interacting the same way with us, right? Because he says, I change not. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So Correct. That's good. That's good. And, and men having a lot. So I think about that with a prophetic word. You know, what is, what is God saying? Because God speaks into eternity. He's an eternal God, right? So God never said something. Well, he said that then, but he's going to say something new today, right? No, no, no. God speaks into eternity. He's eternal. So his word is eternal. So for someone that doesn't quite understand what you mean by eternal, could you say, is it accurate to say that God's word is present progressive? Yes. Okay. Okay. God's word is always in the present progressive. It is, you know, God said this and that was really good, but, you know, um, you know, that's what he said then. Now we need a new word. And yes. we need a new revelation, right? Yes. And, yes. And, and God's word is relevant across this timeline. Uh, the chronos, as we call it, uh, his word is across all of creation for across this continuum of time. God's word is set. That's good. So that dispels the, this is, we have a common theme, my truth your truth right so that dispels these different truths yeah you know god used to have a truth but now it's about me living my truth and it's about them living their truth and everybody's got a truth you know mm -hmm. and so let every man be a lie and god be the truth the truth right that's where that saying comes from you know so what is god saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now 
your dad has passed away. My dad has passed away. And many of the people listening, your, your mother, father may have passed away. But one of the things we, we began to notice was that as, as our parents get to a certain age, they start repeating themselves. So probably the last 20 years of my father's life, he's repeating, giving me a little bit more breath and color into it, but saying the same thing. So that after dad transitioned, I still hear his voice yes. saying what he's always said, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, especially after he was born again, what he's always said, but his heart, I, I, I still hear his heart. Yes. I still hear him telling me, don't procrastinate. Mm -hmm police up that area, straighten that out, make it pretty. I hear all of these words that he gave me. So it is with God's word. And we listen to what he's saying. That's a great example of present progressive because the things that my dad shared with me, I hear them to this day and they are relevant mm -hmm. to my life now. And he shared them with me as a little girl. Right. I remember things he shared with me when I was in the second grade. And I hold on to those things and they become just guiding principles in my life on how to treat others and the type of person, type of woman that I want to be. So, and they are present with me. So they don't time out those words. That's right. So that's good. And the, and the prayers that our parents prayed, they're in eternity. eternity that's they good. were prayed into eternity before God. So my grandmother's prayers you know, 1968, I'm in Frankfurt, Germany. We're in Frankfurt, Germany. And I'm remembering my grandma being on the yes. phone and saying, Frankie, I want you to know I call your name oh, wow. before God every day. Wow. All my grandchildren, I call you and I call your name before God every day. Now, just the courage that I get from that and comfort yes. that that's still around the throne of God being prayed into eternity. It's pretty cool. Yes, it is. So for the person that feel that feels that they are alone and don't have anyone. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, you're not. That's you're not. helpful. Correct. So getting to today's message, right? Uh, so there were there were, you know, as I went before God, there were three there were kind of three things. One is he dealt he dealt with the issue of uh, illness. You know, physician heal yourself. In other words, that um, we are sick as a nation and that we are in need of healing. We, and, and that usually when a person is sick, it's not the outside where the problem is, but it's the inside. So that was the one theme. And that's where the Luke chapter five, you know, and, and verses 27 through 30. Yeah, that's where that comes in. And then, and then the second thing he talked about, well, okay, God, so what's the real issue? If we are sick, what is the real issue? And so, there, um, you know, there was a time, believe it or not, in medieval medicine, um, and it happens today, you'll see where I'm going, that doctors would smell the excrements, the urine or the defecation of people. They would smell it mm -hmm. to see what they smelled in it. Now, we do lab tests today, okay. so it's still right in line. But it's the same thing. So I use the analogy of the soup mm -hmm. and grandma mm -hmm. in the kitchen that if God were to put his finger in the soup of America right now and taste it, mm -hmm. then he would say that something is missing. Correct. Something is missing. And so that was the thought. That's kind of where that came from, mm -hmm. that something is missing. Mm -hmm. In other words, that it's not whole, it's not complete. Mm -hmm. And that the thing that he said was missing his grandma would say, we need another pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. Well, what he would say was missing is that we're missing the salt of the church. Mm -hmm. And so that's where that whole piece wow. came from. Can you see that? I can see that. Yeah. And then, and then the last part comes to, um, you know, why are we missing the salt of the church? And my thought was that the church has lost its way. And so what is the true mission of the church mm -hmm. in seasoning society and in really changing people and not stuff? And I like the point you made. Um, well, this is what I heard um, in relation to that is that the church is within the kingdom 
is within us. Mm -hmm. It is not in a brick and mortar building. And so when Jesus came and he went out to Levi's house, it was the tax collector. Mm -hmm. uh, it was symbolic of the Christ going out into the world. Yes. And he was modeling how we should be. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, there's not, not in, in the walls of the building. Yes, we are being equipped to do the work of the ministry. Yes. So it's so Christ came and showed us showed us a kingdom focus. Yeah, it, it, it always bothers me when I hear a pastor, teachers say, or just a, a Christian, well, the real work of the church is out here uh, rebuilding these neighborhoods and doing this stuff right here and all of that. But but you're right. Um, what we saw was we saw that Christ lived his life in the context of a covenant community. Yes. His covenant community, his family was a part of that. But then those folks that he was walking with and living life with, That's right. what we call a congregational family, a covenant community, they live life together to become disciples of the teaching of Christ, to begin to learn the heart of the Father. It was the equipping. Correct. And Christ... From what I read, and mm -hmm. I know you'll correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. he didn't just do that on a Sunday. Correct. To me, it was as he went along, the mm -hmm. disciples and different crowds, they mm -hmm. followed him mm -hmm. and they were there listening and, and watching him yeah. and taking it in, you know, yes. as he was modeling, as he was sharing, uh, as he was teaching. Yes. It wasn't just one place at one time. Correct. And, and his public ministry, he was here. And if the disciples didn't understand what you see, that their covenant community, church, congregation, or whatever, the covenant community would come back around. But what did you mean when you say that? Yes. What did you mean when you said that? Yes. In other words, it was their opportunity to grow deeper, right? Yes. And, and, and you know, and so that was the cool part. But I, I also want to remember, as we thought about a covenant community, there was no biblical mandate for them to gather in the synagogue on the Sabbath. That was a custom, as was their custom, custom, yep. Yep. as was their tradition. I'm not saying it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Bible says you're supposed to go into, you're supposed to have church or go into, it doesn't say that. Correct. It doesn't say that. It says, remember the Sabbath for certain. Mm -hmm. But as far as uh, when you worship and all of that kind of stuff, that you don't see mandates in there, nor do you see an order of service. And you don't see, you're supposed to have a song and then a prayer and then an offering. Right. And then you don't see all of that, right? right? And so, but what we do see from the example of Christ is that, one, he had his covenant community. And then two, he went out into went the out broader into community. The broader. And that's, that's what you good. saw in Levi, right? Yes, yes. Because the work was people. Mm -hmm. Some of it was in the faith world, but some of it was in the broader world. So he went out to where they were mm -hmm. and among them because he is supposed to be the salt. Correct. And so that segues into um, the example you gave with the soup. And, and as you were sharing, the primary reason for salt mm -hmm. is to preserve what is placed on. Mm -hmm. And so doing the like you said, building the community and all of that, I have seen, I, I, I have seen and witnessed groups from outside come into a community, mm -hmm. do some surface things mm -hmm. and leave. Yes. And the people have not been empowered at all. Mm -hmm. They have not been uh, taught or it's, it's, it was a deed and that was it. It was nothing impactful that would change your life or point a person to God or that it was a deed, check off, and now I'm gone. And I have seen the abuse of that over and over and over. And it, it's good to know that the purpose of salt is to preserve. Yes. And what happens is when, when we go in and, to, and when you share Isaiah 61, we go in is to preserve what is placed on. You don't put salt on something and then pull it off and yeah. put it back in the shaker. Right. So salt doesn't kill what's there in the community. Mm -hmm. It preserves it. Correct. 
But the thing about seasoning too, is an active agent. Mm -hmm. So if you think about seasoning or salt, the salt is supposed to be sprinkled on the meat and penetrate. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to infect the meat so that the meat now tastes salty, right? right? And so when the church comes into a community, mm -hmm. the goal is that the people would be transformed by the salt, that their lives would be seasoned, that that which is good in them would be preserved and that they would become healthy. So what we've seen the abuse of you know, now, now don't forget, Christianity far predates the establishment of America and things like that. Sure. But what we've seen is that when you've got business guys that use the missionaries, mm -hmm. so the missionaries would come into America, come into parts of the world, come into Birmingham in Jesus' name, and then the business guys would come in behind them and they would acquire the land and the buildings and the properties. And so far too often the church was a front wow. for a revolution. Because you know, Malcolm always said that we had a black movement in this country, but it wasn't a revolution because in a revolution there's bloodshed and acquisition of land, right? right? And so what we saw was that when, when the missionaries came into different parts of the world and things like that, then the business guys would be behind them and they would take over the building. And so what would happen if we fall for that okie doke, then we think that, oh wow, the community is transformed because the business guys have now dispossessed the local people of the property and the buildings and have built it back up and look at the shiny buildings. But in the backdrop are broken families. You remember the trip to Cozumel that we took, right? Yes. And you were like, hey, let's go off the back road. And I wanted a real authentic taco. Get some authentic, authentic. tacos. Right? <laughs> we won. She didn't know about Montezuma's revenge, right? <laughs> but anyway, it wasn't that. But it, it's the same way it is in Jamaica and all these other places that you have this area right here where the business people have come in and taken over the area, the tourist dollars go. But when you go a mile inland, yeah. then you began to see the desolation of generations of families, right? right? And so the whole idea was that a community, that America is sick because we're driven by our greed and our lust for power and possession mm -hmm. of that which is not ours. And so when it just, it pains me because it seems like I'm coming against the church and, you know, and I have black pastors sometimes, well, you know, this is going to be great because once that white church pulls out of there, they did a lot of good stuff, you know, they fed folks and all of that. But when, but what you saw was the transition of property there that went over, right? And, and so they're saying that this is the way to go. So then they began to invite other folks to come into the community that have money and resources that don't that aren't indigenous to the community and they think this is community transformation praise the lord hallelujah and it's not, it's not. because a community is not transformed until the people in that community are transformed until the hearts of the people are transformed and if we don't get that then we become progenitors, we become the driving force, not of restoring the communities, but destroying them. And so when, when, when I see, I grew up in the hood, man, I know about this and I know, you can grow up in the hood and be ignorant Correct. and you can grow up in the suburbs and be ignorant. Correct. Because you grow up in the hood doesn't mean that you learned what you needed to learn. Exactly. Right? You may have learned how to survive a certain right, way, right, but right. it may not be you know, what's necessary to thrive, you know? Yeah, so, so you know, so I, I, I had a black pastor who said to me, well, man, you know, I've seen, I've seen, you know, white churches come into the hood and feed, but I hadn't seen black churches going into the community to feed. Well, we were feeding, um, what was it? We were feeding about 10,000 white families every week with our outreach ministry exactly. while he was talking about that. Probably because he's not hanging out in the white exactly. community of need, which is more vast than the black yes. community. Yes, it is. Right? Mm -hmm. But when you buy into a false gospel, mm -hmm. that the gospel of Jesus Christ has to do with um, cutting grass, 
picking up trash, repainting buildings, putting businesses in there that the local people don't own, redoing houses that the local people aren't going to move into and can't move into. None dare call that transformation. Are you, you seeing what I'm saying? I, I do. And, and so my heart is broken because we got the, we've got these pastors and especially black pastors who grew up in the hood and there's a spirit of lack who are thinking that this is the way to do it. So the next thing they do is, hey, we need y'all over here too. Hey, we need y'all over here too. And it's going against what the scripture lays out and is healthy community development, which is people. And I think that if the leaders see the value that's within them, wow. that you wow. are God's workmanship wow. with your brown skin, with your black skin, you have resources, you have, you are God's workmanship. You are uniquely made to be the salt in that area where God has placed you. We don't need salt from a different shaker to come in. We have what we need. God has given us what we need. And so I've been hearing over and over again, and, and you've shared this with me, start where you are, work with what you have, make the most of what you have. Then I believe, and this is what I see in my life, God will increase because we're being good stewards of what he's given us. So if I have $5, if I take that $5, don't not, I not necessarily look for someone that's outside of me, to, to, oh, I'm waiting for someone with 5000 to help my neighbor. If I help with the $5 I have, I believe God will increase that because I'm helping to empower the place where God has planted me to preserve that place. Yes, yes. A planting of the Lord for, for the, the display, display of, of his, his splendor. splendor. Yes. Right. So, so here's the deal. And this, and we've told, so, and... This brother said, well, look, tell me the name of your organization so I can make your name great, right? I said, no, that's, that's, that's the whole problem. Because you will begin to think that when we pull out, there's going to be a void. Correct. In other words, what us going to do now that Church of the Highlands has left Gate City? Well, what did us do prior to that? Well, we didn't do nothing. Well, that's not the case. Many of us were already in Gate Correct. City. Many churches are already working, working there. there. Yes. And so this uh, is the whole idea that that this group of believers, our our group of believers coming in community or whatever other church, that they are the savior and it's God that is the, God savior. Is the savior. God is the provider. God is. So yes. if, if the pastors miss the fact that God is using a black church, a white church, a brown church, a Hispanic and Native American church, that it's God that is using that church yes. to meet the needs of the people in the community. It is not the yes. church that is the savior, yes. but it is God it is who is God. the savior. And so when I hear, Pat, well, what's going to happen now? Is the black church going to step up? Is the this church? I'm not counting on the black church to step up. I'm counting on God's That's church right. to step up. That's right. You know, I, I think about when you said that, I mean, so many things are coming to my mind. Even when with Gideon, right when when he was to go and God had a victory already lined up for Gideon, uh -huh. and he had him whittle away. No, you have too many with you. You have too many. Lord have mercy. You have too many. And next, you know, he had this small number. Yeah. And see, we think we have to go big. We think we have to have a lot before we can do something. And God is saying for me to show, so you can see that it's me. You don't need all of that, but I'm going to show myself strong and mighty in the earth through you and right. the little bit you have so people will glorify me, yeah. which is in heaven. And, and God doesn't want us to be able to boast, but we're to boast in him. Yes. You know? Yes. So it could be that all this stuff, God is just leveling out like he told me. He's leveling things out so we can see that God is our source, yes. God is our supply, and we must rely and depend on him. Yes, did you hear that? The Lord will provide, will provide. for your family, yes. for your neighborhood, for your community. Yes. And when people like us, they come in and others, they come in in the name of the Lord, then what you say is thank you for being obedient yes. to God. 
Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You've been obedient to God. Exactly. You know, exactly. You know, um, when I left corporate to become a missionary, meaning I had to live off of support through donations. I think mm -hmm. we did that for 10 years or something like that. And, and I remember thinking, here I was making, we were making all of this money over here in corporate. And now, you know, we're having to, you know, trade down and, and you know, uh, we got to wait on somebody to make donations and the like. And, you know, and God said to me, he said, you were never that good. I you remember, remember that? that. I remember I've that, yeah. always been your source yes. and supply. Yes. And if you are a pastor and you have a congregation of people following you and you are wondering, what are we going to do now that so-and-so is gone or this church is gone? Then by faith and in faith in God, we shall say or we should say, the Lord will right. supply. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. In fact, in his words, he's declared that. Yes, that's a promise. I will. I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So when somebody says, well, this church has left this community, what us going to do? God then, will supply. then they're showing their lack of faith mm -hmm. in God Correct. and they're showing their misplaced faith mm -hmm. in a man-made organization. And I had to shift. I had the um, experience of paradigm shift with that because you know, I worked in corporate many mm -hmm. years. Checks were nice. Benefits were great, you know. And when God shifted me mm -hmm. um, to nonprofit, I, I, I went, I had to go, I, I had to have a paradigm shift. I had to experience that because I was looking at the, the nice checks from that organization as my supply right right and i and i didn't know what to do with that because i was used to this certain amount of money coming in this certain you know i was used to that but god said no but with that and and i'm speaking for me he said with that you have developed an employee mindset and i called you to be in the forefront i called you to be to lead and you can't lead with an employee mindset so i'm pulling you away from that because trevor what i have for you to do the way you're thinking is not lining up to what i called you to walk in i think that i think that there's a word that is in here and, and in that word it's saying for those of you many folks have you've lost your jobs or the job has been you've been furloughed and all of those and you're wondering what you are going to do and part of this is a recalibration of our time. And what I hear, and what I hear God saying as we're going through this is that that wasn't just a message for us, but that's a message for you that God has always been your source and supply. You were never that good. You, you know, you've done things that, you know, you could have gotten fired from, but the Lord covered you. God opened doors for you. And that same God that protected you all those years will be the same God that will get you through this new challenge as you deal with your Goliath in this economic downturn. Exactly. I think that's what David said, right? The same God. How, how you know, um, Goliath looked at him and said, David, thou dog. Yes. You know, in other words, you are as a dog to me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you remember that? And he, and he says to him, he says, he says, you know, who are you to challenge me? Yes. And David looks and says, that same Jesus. That's right. That same God that brought us through this, the lion, that brought us through the bear, will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine yes. into my hand. Exactly. I am persuaded that our yes. faith should be in God, yes. not in our ability. Yes not in the armor of other people. Exactly. You remember he turned down the exactly. armor of Saul. It didn't fit him. But David's yes. faith is in God. in God. And I think that this is a season where God wants us to learn that we are to have not faith in faith, Correct. but faith in God. God. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so that, you know, I think that that's one of the themes in mm -hmm. believing that God has you. 
Exactly. All right, so uh, share share a few notes of what you had coming through here. There's so much more. The Holy Spirit illuminates so oh, much yes. through a message, it's right? So much. It is so much. And what I'm still it? hearing. But one of the things, and I shared this, is um, Luke 14, 34 through 35. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he says, we are the salt of the earth. And so, it, and um, that tied in, we are the salt of the earth. Lord, so what are you saying with that? What are you saying? And I went back and I thought about God wanted his people free to serve him. Mm -hmm. He wanted us free to serve him. That's one of the primary reasons. And as we do that, then we go to God, we serve God. Then we're set free. We're set free to be yes. salty. And then yes. we go out mm -hmm. to, to where God sends us to preserve, mm -hmm. to enhance, yes. the salt enhances, mm -hmm. and come back to God. Mm -hmm. And go back to intercede. I, I, I see that intercession, and there's a saltiness in there. Yes. We don't have to be behind a mic or in a pulpit yes. to be the salt of the earth. Correct. God uniquely made us. And He's counting on that, yes. by the way, that all of us won't be behind a microphone in that. Correct. Correct. And, you know, He counts on maybe my quirkiness and he counts on your seriousness and yeah. he counts on us to be who he created us to be. So yeah. everyone will be reached. Yes. I think a, a perfect example is that is the coronavirus 19 and the COVID-19, right? Where are we going with it? <laughs> right. A perfect example of it. If we wanted an example in the natural yes. to show what God wants in the spirit mm -hmm. is that this thing is penetrating so they say it's not airborne, but it's spread person to person. Mm -hmm. So these little molecules like season. So when you pour salt on meat, that salt literally infects that meat. It travels down the veins of that meat mm -hmm. to change the seasoning of that meat. Mm -hmm. And so God's goal is that we as the church would infect our nation mm -hmm. with godliness. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, and, be, and, and, and there are pastors say, well, why should we repent? I've been preaching the word. I've been doing this right here. I, 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 I. But where is the salt? Have you been infecting your community with godly justice that punishes the wicked and restores the righteous? Have you been infecting your community with godliness and goodness and justice? God says, I hate injustice, Correct. but yet our communities are infected with it. And so when the church says, well, we've been the salt, when I taste the ministry of the church, it doesn't taste salty, it tastes meaty. When I taste the ministry, when God puts his finger in the ministry of the church, it doesn't taste salty, it tastes worldly. Mm. Are you, are you, in other words, Instead of the church infecting the world, the world begins to infect the church. Good stuff. Let's feed. Let's do that. Let's do that. But who's being the salt? And God is saying that when I infect you with my spirit, when I fill you with my spirit, I need you to go into the community and not take folks' houses and property. I need you to infect the people with restoration and wholeness so that they can steward their properties, build up the old waste places, let the prisoners go free, Isaiah 61, right? Return the men into the homes, restore the families so that they can begin to build up the generational devastation. You know, I think about when I cook, I, a, a good soup or a good stew, you know, you put that salt in, when you at different stages also. So it can marry into the flavoring of it. Uh -huh. And when I um when when I when I prepare meat like to grill or to cook, 
I like to marinate it. So when we go in and out, in and out, it's so not that's the life on life then. Correct. That's so the it life can marinate. Life. So it can marinate. So discipleship, we go and we spend, right. we invest our lives in other lives. Correct. Not buildings. Exactly. Like a, a, a roast, that meat is thick. A roast, you have to massage that salt in there. That takes time. That takes effort. That's why they call it a rub sometimes, Correct. right? Correct. You rub it in there and it, it hangs out. And that's how why how the salt can penetrate into the, the meat, into the sinew and all into that meat. It has to hang out. It has to, you know, rub, get oh, that's massaged good. in there. That's good. That's good. So if we're going to see transformation in the city, mm -hmm. we're going to have to be present in proximity present. and rub. If we're going to yes. see um, transformation in the policy that our city halls create, we're going to have to have godly people that are present, but yes. not only present, but being willing to rub. Correct. When policy is being made, remember the poor, mm -hmm. remember the widows, remember the orphans. Mm -hmm. When people want to be prejudiced against different groups, no, God says have love for them all. That's right. Every one Everyone. matters. That's Every right. one bears the image. So we're supposed to rub that. Correct. But if we're not there, one, if we're not present, mm -hmm. and then we're not active, mm -hmm. it won't happen. One of the first things that I learned when, when working with the community and working with, with the girls and, and doing the character development and, you know, we were working. One thing I learned, I had to show up every week the same time so they can begin to trust me. Whether they all showed up or not. Whether right? they all showed up or not. They knew it. They knew it. If they didn't show up, they were looking to see if I was there. And because we had conversation, oh, well, I saw your car. You know, I didn't come, but I looked out and I saw you there. Because the people, in order for them, they have to, a trust relationship has to be built. And that is built by getting in there. Yes. by being a part, by being present and involved. And they began to trust and open up and allowing you yes. to, to influence them. Right. You had, then you earn the right to speak. Then you earn the right. But to just go in, do a deed and leave out, yes. or throw a turkey over the wall, you haven't earned anything. You haven't earned their trust in order to, to open up to you, to allow you to season them. To allow you to influence, to so allow you to you be had sold. to be available. I had to be. Available. So you had to be faithful. You had to be available. You had to be continuously present in Correct. close proximity. Correct. Right? And that's what it takes. Yes. It's life on life. Mm -hmm. And so again, when the buildings and the property becomes the priority instead of the people, then we'll miss it. We'll miss so look, it. these last five minutes. So I want to hear some of the no more of the notes that you have on what you heard God saying, and and you kind of you kind of uh. Um, uh, share those pieces. Um, one of the pieces out of Luke, when um, when Jesus went to Levi and the Pharisees and all, they you know we don't we we don't interact with people like that. We don't interact with you know. Do you know who this man is? And Jesus was like, yes, I know, and I did it on purpose. And I, this stood out in Luke five thirty one through thirty two. Um, Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Wow. That stood up. We have to go where wow. people are. We have to go where they are and be a godly influence wow. in their world. We have to be willing That's good. to allow to allow. Our God to use our God-given design yes. and be available for others. And what I noticed through that, when we open up and we do that, I tell you, my life has become so enriched mm -hmm. because when I operate that way, true to my God-given design and fight through my flesh with, with fear or whatever it is, with whatever reluctance I have, I feel I am a much better person during the outcome because when I, when I think of that, some of 
the lives that we were able to touch and impact. Yeah. It was a it was God using our design. Yes. Because some of the people had been rejected so much. Yes. And they looked at us as okay, you're gonna reject us too because you don't look like us, you don't talk like us. But trusting our God, trusting what God placed in us and trusting our design and, and flowing with God, we were able to make an impact and see those very people become successful. Wow. Yes. And it's not for anybody to know, it's not, hey, this is what I did, it's to say that the word of God is true. He designed each and every one of us on purpose, for a purpose. And if we should, we give in to that and no longer resist and no longer allow people to define who we are, tell us what they see, but we, we ab abide in our God-given design, so much will come out. So many people will yes. be impacted. So much will come from that. Wow. That's so powerful. The purpose of the church is not for the church. Mm -hmm. but for the kingdom, for of, the God, kingdom of God, for God's glory. Yes, yes. That we are in the service of mankind, in God's service, yes. to serve men, to see people and lives transformed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the people. It's the people. Not the geography, not the area, Correct. not the buildings and the houses. Yes. It's the people. For God so well, loved. I was just thinking that. Right? The world. The business district of Birmingham that he sent his only begotten done son so that none of the buildings downtown would perish, that Birmingham would always have a beautiful downtown area, right? But no, the person, yes. until people matter, violence will continue. Correct. Until people matter, the homeless will be left out, the naked will be unclothed, the hungry will go unfed. The problem is, People don't matter. Correct. And so the thing, Black Lives Matter, well, all lives matter. No, no, I'm telling you that they don't. I'm telling you that Black Lives Matter. I know, but all lives, no, you're not hearing me. Exactly. Right? It should be more than a theme. It should be, it should be woven into the thought processes exactly. that show that. I tell you, if, and this, when you said that, it gave me, a great illustration if we're talking and I feel that I'm being neglected or whatever and I come to you mm -hmm. and I say hey I want to know if I matter do I matter to you and if you say Trevor all wives matter we'll have a problem I love all the church members. <laughs> I love all the church that's members. a problem no but, I, you but you're one of the church members you so I love you too acknowledged me you have not acknowledged, you have not shown me that you see me and that I matter. Do you think it really makes that big a difference? It makes a difference. Jeremiah 29, 11. Yeah. Well, I know the thoughts and our plans I that I have for all of y'all. No, I have towards you. To, to prosper everybody, to, to prosper give everybody you. a hope and a future to an expected end. Does it God matter? spoke specifically, yes, it matters. In Jeremiah 1 and 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I have a plan for you. So when so so when Jesse Jackson said, I am somebody mm -hmm. that mattered to somebody that yes. didn't see that they were somebody. Yes. When James Brown said, I'm, do you know? I'm black and I'm proud. I'm black and I'm proud. That yes. meant something. Yes. What are they talking about? Yes. When they yes. talked about black power, yes. what are they talking about? Just like growing up, I remember um Ms. Brenda Banks Smith, I love her so she's passed on. But I remember when I was, I mean, young, mm -hmm. eight, seven, eight years old, she would have these sessions. She she was the choir director, and we all had to take music. And we learned a song, Young, Gifted, and Black. And I remember that song to this day. And that placed value in me. Before I knew who God created me to be, before I I, I um, consciously gave my life to Christ. Miss Brenda Banks Smith taught me a song, Young, Gifted, and Black. And that added value to me. Wow. And so I remember that. Wow. So those things matter. Those wow. things matter. We can no longer 
be reckless with our words when we're talking to one another because words impact. Wow, it, it matters. It matters. Wow. So to not say Black Lives Matter, it, it's, it's not about, oh, I just want you to agree with me. No, no, no. It's an acknowledgement. It is an acknowledgement to say, you see me and what I care about, you care about. And you're going to look out for me and you're going to make sure things are, things are well for me, just like they are well for everyone else. I want you, I want to be on your mind when you sit at the table and you dole out provisions and you, you, you dole out. I want, I want black people to be on your mind. Wow. Wow. I want to know that I matter. Right. When policy is being made. Correct. We want to know that black people matter too. Correct. Because we don't see all lives being beaten down and lost on no, the traffic don't. stop. No, we don't. We don't see all young girls being beaten by the police exactly. officers like they're men. Exactly. We don't see that with everybody. Right. No, we don't. We don't we don't see strange fruit hanging from the tree. Exactly. Right, as Nina Simone talked about. Exactly. Why in the world would even, you know, you all were taught down here in the South, the uh, Negro National Anthem, right? I think it was Lift Every, Lift voice, every voice and, and sing. sing, right? Yeah. And that became the Negro National Anthem. And I was just sitting here thinking, why would you need words or a national anthem? And here's what it says, lift every voice and sing. So let all lives sing that this is true till earth to earth and heaven ring, ring with harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the last, the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Wow. There's an experience that in the becoming of we in America, we all have not had. And that's not gonna come from the generosity of white folks. It's not going to come from the, the veracity of pursuing it from black and brown, red and yellow. It's gonna come because God has dealt with the hearts of all folks. Until God deals with the heart, it's just like a community. We have treated the symptoms, yes. but we have not dealt mm -hmm. with the cancer that is eating us from within. Exactly. So we have a decision to make. Right. We have a decision to make to be who God created us to be. Yes. And to say, okay, Lord, I want to be salty. Yes. I want to be. And, and to no longer resist being salt, to try to be pepper or something else. We are the salt of the earth. Salt has a specific purpose. God puts salt in the word for a reason. Correct. When we're willing to stand up and say that I'm no longer going to do things the white way. And I'm no longer going to do things the black way, but I'm going to do them the right way, that God has a sense, God has a standard for what is right yes. and what is wrong. Yes. And until we are willing to say that some things are right and some things are wrong, it's not right to treat her uh, fairly because she's a woman. It's right to treat her fairly because it's the right thing to do. It's right to treat him fairly because it's the right thing to do. It's right to put life over property because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah 61 makes that clear. Until we care about the least of these in our community, until the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes about people, then it will be ineffective for the reason for which it was created. Wow. Salt was never meant to be a diamond. Right. It was meant to season. Right. 
and to hear. Correct. Well, I appreciate you recapping this with me. I'm really excited about it. I guess you can tell too. You're excited about it too. If God put his finger in the soup of America and said, what's missing? He would say, God is missing. But he would not want us to look to the sky for God. He would want us to look at ourselves as the church and saying, okay, it's my job to carry the salt of God and the light of God into my workplace on tomorrow morning. So we can't be afraid to stand up for righteousness as a white person or a person of color. Brother, even if you are that one of five or one of 10 black folks that are in the place, if, if you just stood up for not black folks, but just for what's right by God's standard. If you're one of, if you're, if you're just one woman in a room full of 30 people, you don't have to stand up for all the women, but just stand up for what is right. And when you stand up for what is right, that woman will be taken care of. That senior will be taken care of. That youth will be taken care of. The black and brown will be taken care of when you simply stand up for what's right. And when we see wrong pervasive in our community, it's because you who call upon the name of the Lord as your savior, as God is your God, that you have not been salt in the places that he has allowed you to go. For that reason, the church must repent. If your city is not a safe place for everybody and you are a church in that city and you have not been crying aloud against it, you need to repent. And we need to be right alongside it. We can all just join together and repent because it happened while we were watching and somebody should have spoken up that that's wrong. Not because he's black, but it's wrong, because it's wrong. George Floyd died and it was bad, not because he was black and it was a white cop, but because it was wrong and everybody stayed quiet. Samir Rice, when he gunned down, he was wrong and everybody stayed quiet. And God is watching. God says, as I put my finger in the soup of America, what is missing is justice. And what is missing is righteousness. Until there is justice and righteousness, there will be no peace. Look, we love you guys. Tell everybody bye. We'll see bye. you next week. See you next week. And uh, thank you so much for thank you for debriefing and sharing with me. I mean, I, I'm thinking about what God is doing. What is He up to all the time? So, love you. Appreciate you. We got to do this more often. You gang? I'm gang. All right. Hey, <laughs> y'all have a good one. God's Bye. grace and peace to you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.